I do gotta be a little bit honest right up here at the beginning. This talk scares me a lot. Now, I'm not scared because of the topic. I actually think the topic is something we really need to talk about. I'm actually really excited about what I'm terrified of is the name of this series. Like, guys, I love Jesus, but the wrong words slip out every now and then. And don't judge me, because I know some of you do the same thing. And then being from Georgia does not help it, because being from Georgia, my it can sound a lot like other stuff in a hurry. And, and I actually got friends placing a bet if I can make it through today or not. I mean, with friends like them, you don't need enemies. What, you know what I mean? Well, if this is your first time joining us, uh, we're in the middle of an awesome series called When It Hits the Fan. And we've been defining it as it is the circumstances and moments that you didn't ask for and didn't feel prepared for. It is the circumstances and moments that you didn't ask for and don't feel prepared for. Man, you know those moments. Some are big, some are small. I mean, it's discovering the water heater gave up the ghost in the basement and decided to bust all over the place. It's the call that your kid was a, an idiot and got arrested. And you're like, why did you do that? It's the doctor. The doctor saying, hey, why don't you come in for us to talk through those results? It's the team being posted who made the team and who didn't make the team and your name's not on the list. It's finding out that they actually were cheating. It's saying that thing in that way that just explodes what was once a really peaceful conversation into just a mess in a heartbeat. I mean, it, it comes in all shapes and sizes, but when it hits, it hits so hard. Jason, uh, he's just done an incredible job over the last few weeks. And if I had to condense everything that he said over the last three weeks into a couple of statements, this is what I feel like he's been reminding of us, uh, that when it hits the fan, we're being reminded that we're not alone, that God is in it with us. We've been reminded that God's not surprised, that he can use it to refine us. We've been reminded that it's not a waste. God uses us to help others. And this week, this week we're talking about what makes all of that possible in our lives. Uh, we're talking about the power source that's driving all of this, whether we realize it or not. The power source that if we learn to tap into it can actually profoundly change our lives. And I'm not being silly or overpromising about that. I actually was profoundly reminded of this truth, of this power source just a few weeks ago. My wife and I, we found ourselves in a moment that it was hitting the fan in a big way. And as words are literally coming out of her mouth and my blood is starting to boil, I kid you not, I heard as clear as day in the back of my head, Matt, this is it hitting the fan and how you respond is how you'll get to preach. And I didn't like that moment because I wanted to respond one way, but I knew I would stand before you today and I'd have to choose what to do. And that it was a harder moment than I ever really want to admit that it was. Uh, but here's the story. I, I think you guys will hopefully enjoy the story. So a couple of months ago, we needed to replace my wife's car. Now I'm realizing that although I am still young and I will tell myself that I am young for decades to come, I am slowly becoming a crotchety old man on the inside when it comes to technology. Now, where is all my anti-technology people at? Like when I fly, I want a physical ticket. I don't want an app. I don't want a digital wallet. I don't want to figure out a passcode. I don't want to remember a login. I just want a piece of paper to say, I want on the plane, put my butt on the plane. I don't want an app. On the other hand, my wife loves the app. She'll check in 15 days in advance. She'll skip all the lines. She's like, this is awesome. And I'm like, I'll see you in 10 days. Like, I don't want to do that. She loves it. It stresses me. I love paying with a debit card. Like looking someone in the eye and saying, here's my money. She loves to take her watch and wave it magically over something. <laughs> she loves the newest technology and I'm regressing in the technology game. But I love her and she makes my life better. Add to all of this, my wife was born in Hawaii and is a leftover hippie. Like she is a flower child if there ever was one. So many staff members are like, your wife's so granola. And I'm like, yep, yep. I don't know how a flower child and a redneck married, but it's worked for 18 years. We, we like, God works miracles. But like, we, it's great. <laughs> so all that to say, 
when it came time to replace her car, she really, 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 really wanted an EV, a fully electric car. And I really wanted big tires. And I need to let you guys know, the more she really wanted the electric car, the more I got terrified. Like, have you ever looked into buying an EV? Like, I don't know if you know this about electric cars or not, but there's like multiple types of chargers. Like for, like you gotta find the charger that fits your car. And then on top of that, the chargers come in like three different phases. Like there's like slow chargers, medium chargers, fast chargers, and some charging stations, I mean like they're super slow. Like if you wind up at this one, you're stuck for 18 hours slow. And then there's other ones that are fast, like super fast that are like 40 minutes fast. And on top of all of this, you figure all of that out with like apps, on your phone with logins. And then you gotta figure out which app will take you to which charger. And if you screw it up, you're gonna be at a slow one versus a fast one or one that won't even fit your car. So all that to say, I was stressing. And guys, I'm not trying to say anything political here. So please do not make this political. I'm not being political, but I did figure out a long time ago, there's a gas station on every corner. (laughs) And the only thing you gotta know about a gas station is gas or diesel. And you only make that mistake once. But that's a story for another day. (laughs) That was a bad phone call home. Hey, Dad, (laughs) the green handle's not for your car. Um, So you're starting to get the point. Hopefully you're feeling my anxiety and my stress around this car purchase. And the more she talked, the more overwhelmed and stressed I got. I simply did not have the desire, the time, the patience to figure out how to charge an adult power wheel. I I just couldn't go there. (laughs) Well, if you've been married for more than 30 seconds, you know where this is going. My wife really, 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 really wanted an EV and I really, 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 really wanted to stay married. And so (laughs) we're getting closer and she said these magical words to me. She goes, Matthew. She used the full name, folks. It's getting real. She goes, Matthew, this is my car, and these are my problems. And it was like the clouds broke, and the birds started chirping, and a cool breeze came in, and I was like, you're absolutely right. This is your problem. All I gotta have is a generator to come get you off the side of the road. I just gotta help pay for it, honey. Let's go get you a car. I'm your hero, your knight in shining armor. This is your car, your problems, not my control. I am here for you. So we ended up getting her a, an adult power wheel. And uh, it's awesome. Like I, I, have to be, I have to be honest, it is a great car. Like if you've never driven an EV, they're super fun. Like it's one of the peppiest cars I've ever driven. Like you hit the pedal and I would say you like the gas launches you, the battery launches you. I don't know how it works, but it launches and it's fun. And then the other thing is like, I don't know how this works, but like I sit down and my phone just starts playing music like magic. Like, I don't know how my phone and the car talks, but it's like, as soon as my butt hits the seat, it's like, here's your music. And I'm like, I like this, go. Like, it's awesome. And so it's been really, really good. She really, really loves the car. She's happy, I'm happy. But here's the moment the fan and our it hit. Christmas. And Christmas means road trips. And road trips for us this year means we're going to Pearl's family. And sadly, Pearl's family no longer lives in Hawaii. They live in the Antarctica of the United States. They live in the upper peninsula of Michigan. (laughs) This is us, folks. This is the part of Michigan you think is Canada. Like, (laughs) it's the forgotten hand of Michigan. It's the upper hand, It's, it's forever. And just to put this in perspective, like from here, to Detroit is eight hours because there's interstates. Then from here to here is another 10 hours because it's wilderness. So we're talking about an 18 hour road trip and that's if you don't have to pee or stop for gas or in our case, a charge that may take 45 minutes or 18 hours. You're gambling with your life. You don't know how long it's gonna be. So the thought of driving our adult power wheel all the way through the wilderness to the upper peninsula of Michigan had me stressing. But Pearl, my amazing hippie loving wife, she's like, I got you. I got a plan. It's all going to work out until I screwed it up. See, it was one of those days that I, from a good, good, good place in my heart, was just trying to help. 
Uh, but my stress, my anxiety had me like kind of wound up over this thing. So I started researching for her and started sending her links for the best way to plan an EV road trip. I was sending her acts of love. Well, again, if you've been married for 30 seconds, you'd know what happened. I was trying to help. She thought I took over. And so I must confess, it was December the 26th at about 6.45 in the morning. We're 40 miles into our 1,000-mile road trip, and I casually look over to the love of my life, and I say, so what's your plan? And she goes, what plan? And I was like, the plan to get the Hot Wheel all the way to Antarctica and back plan. And she goes, oh, oh, don't you remember? You, you took over that plan. What's your plan? And this is the moment I realized I screwed up big. She thought I'd taken over. I thought I was just being loving. And let's just say that by the time we made it from here, our eight-hour road trip to Detroit, we managed to squeeze it into 15 hours. We're great at road tripping. And so we finally made it to Detroit 15 hours later and realized we have to figure out how to get through the wilderness. The stress was up. And as we're in the hotel room, both on our computers, trying to figure out how we're gonna make it from here to here, we realized what we needed here wasn't there and, and there's no chargers right there. And here we go. Here comes the fan. Here comes us. And poof, there we go. So in the middle of our hotel room, with as much grace as I could muster, knowing that I would be confessing to you guys right now, I'll, I asked my wife, I said, so, so are you telling me we're the morons who just started a 20 hour road trip in a car that can't make it? <laughs> she smiles and goes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> guys, you know that moment where you're just so mad <laughs> You're mad at yourself, you're mad at the situation, you're just overwhelmed and looking for someone, anyone to blame, to accuse, to let all of that frustration out. That was my moment. That was it hitting the fan for me. And in this particular moment, I not only had my amazing, loving, incredible hippie wife of 18 years looking back at me with her big old eyes, I had the two set of eyes of my sons right over her shoulder in the hotel room going, Dad? <laughs> I was about to lose my it all over <laughs> the hotel room. So I gotta ask a question. Who has control of your life when it hits the fan? Who has control of your life when it hits the fan? Who's behind the will of your emotions? Don't we all? Don't we all want to be cool, calm, and collected? But how do we do that? How do we, in those moments, respond? Guys, everything in me wanted to respond one way, but there was this small voice that was calling, begging, dragging me towards a different response. And that voice, that's what we're talking about today. That's the power source that we're gonna be talking about. We're talking about how can we have the power to respond differently when it hits the fan? Because don't we all, don't we all want the power to respond differently when it hits the fan? Don't we all want that power? And that power, that voice comes from the Holy Spirit. So we gotta remember that when it hits the fan, we're not alone, God's with us. We gotta remember, God's not surprised and he can use it to refine us. We gotta remember, it's not a waste. God uses it to help others. And we gotta remember, we're not powerless. We're not powerless. Now, I would be lying if I said that night didn't have some tears and some apologies. But the next morning, as we're sitting in our rental car, processing, <laughs> glad you guys got that. As we're sitting in our rental car, <laughs> processing as a family, Pearl and I still loved each other. And we actually still liked each other. And our family was learning how to face stress together. 
And we still had a pretty good vacation together. But that voice, that whisper, that nudge to go a different way, that, that's what we're talking about today. So what does it mean that God's spirit lives inside of us and when we lean into it, we have a power beyond ourselves to respond in a way outside of our normal selves, outside of our normal desired responses. Because let's be honest, left to myself that night in the hotel room, I would have been cussing and fussing and throwing a tantrum like a three-year-old. That's who I am. But because of the Holy Spirit's work in me, over the years, he's changing me. He's convicting me. He's catching me. He's leading me. So how do we respond in his power when it hits the fan in our lives? But, we talk, but before we talk about that, we, we need to make sure that we all know what we're actually talking about. So there's two big questions that comes to mind when it comes to the Holy Spirit and his place in his life. We gotta answer, who is he? Who is the Holy Spirit? And what does he do? What does the Holy Spirit do? So let's start with, who is he? That's a great question. Now, I'm about to be pretty vulnerable with you guys. I went to Bible college and then I went to seminary. And in all of my systematic theology courses, the theologians wanted me to remember a phrase. And so I learned it to pass the test. And the phrase that I learned to pass the test was this. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Trinity. The Trinity is three separate persons existing as one being, all separate, yet equal, yet one. Let me read that again. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity. The Trinity is three separate persons existing as one being, all separate, yet equal, yet one. Now this is where I'm gonna be really, really honest. I have been chewing on that statement for over 20 years and I'm still trying to fully figure it out. But here's what I'm starting to put together. See, we, you might hear us talk about God or God the Father and then Jesus, the Son of God, and then there's the Holy Spirit. And, and those three make up the Trinity, the persons of God. And if you wanna really impress your friends, you can even say the triune God, the one God of three persons, all three of them. And, and guys, libraries are full of commentaries about this stuff and how they interact and what they all do. But in my super simple Southern way of making sense of this, Here's what I figured out. You got God the Father, God the Son, that's Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. They're all God, yet separate, yet somehow one. It might help to think of it as this. They're all three, all throughout the Bible, but God the Father is kind of like the main character in the Old Testament. God the Son, Jesus, is the main character in the Gospels. And then God the Holy Spirit is the main character in and through us until Jesus' return. So who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God working in and around us. And, his follow, and for his followers of Jesus, he is God with you right now living in you. I love this last part. For followers of Jesus, he is God with you right now living in you. For those of us who've accepted and believed in Jesus and what he did for us through his life, death, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the living God in you, working through you right now. He, he's guiding you, he's nudging you, he's leading you, he's inviting you, he's convicting you, he's moving in you. I was telling, talking to some friends about this the other day and we got to start talking about how the Holy Spirit lives in us and, and he's with us when that person's bending over and you're like, do I look or do I not? He's with you when the tea is getting spilled and the gossip train is coming and you're leaning hard to hear what's being said two tables down. The Holy Spirit's with us when that person says that thing that makes our blood boil and the words start to come. He's with us at the bar and he's with us in the car and he's with us when we're at our best and he's with us when we're at our worst. And you can interpret him being with us in two different ways. Uh, one way is you can start to feel embarrassed, shamed, like you're caught in the act, you're busted, which honestly just kind of reveals your view of God more than anything. And it sounds like that view is way more of God as a discipline, disciplinarian, just waiting to get you. Or, or you can interpret that, though, that through the Spirit, he's right here with you and he's giving you strength, support, empowerment, telling us that, helping us know when we've stepped out of bounds and coaching us back in and, and rallying behind us and cheering us on, reminding us that we're not who we once were and that we're in fact a new creation in Christ, which in my opinion is the way that God intended for us to view it. 
Which then leads us to the second question. What does the Holy Spirit do? If we know who he is, then what does he do? And, and see, the Holy Spirit is living in us, not out to get us or bust us or to be a whole monitor of our lives. He's living in us to equip us, to empower us, to mobilize us, to live the lives he knows is best for us. See, this is what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Jesus described it this way in John chapter 14. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit. Now this word advocate's a really fun Greek word. It's the Greek word paraclete, which carries the idea of one who comes alongside us, who comes along as a comforter, an encourager, a counselor. And isn't that exactly what we need when it hits the fan? A comforter? an encourager, a guider. I used to think of the Holy Spirit as like a boxing coach who's at the edge of the ring, just right over my shoulder, shouting at me in the middle of the fight. And I'm in the middle of the fight and I'm throwing punches and I'm taking punches, but he's right there coaching and supporting and helping heal. But if I'm honest, that metaphor lets me be the hero. Like I'm still the the hero in the ring. And I'm starting to realize a better way to view the Holy Spirit is actually the Holy, is, the, is a metaphor of like a tandem bike, which you know a tandem bike's like a two-seater bike. You got the front seat and the back seat. And, and the Holy Spirit lets me have the front seat. So I'm still pedaling and I'm still steering. I still choose where we go, but he's right over my shoulder. He's actually in the power seat. He's the one really moving the bike forward. He's he's there coaching and encouraging and reminding and directing. And when I get gassed out, he powers through. And when it hits the fan and I don't have the strength, he does. And when I'm ready to give up, he's willing to dig in. And all he asks is that I stay on the bike and keep steering and keep letting him power us forward. We're told in Acts that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We're told in Romans that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. I'm realizing the Holy Spirit really is the power source. He's just inviting me to ride along, to let him be there. So Jesus keeps telling us about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, he is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you and later will be in you, living in you. I mean, that's a crazy thought to think about, that the God of the universe put his spirit in you, with you, walking step and step with you. So Jesus continues, And he says, I'm telling you these things now while I'm I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I've told you. So we're realizing the Holy Spirit is living in us, with us at all times power us, encourage us, to guide us, to teach us, to comfort us. Why? Man, it's a great question. And there's an answer. Why is the Holy Spirit in us, with us, empowering us, encouraging us, guiding us, teaching us, comforting us? Why is he doing all of that? So when it hits the fan, when life gets crazy, and when the world around us goes nuts, and everything in us wants to armor up and attack and retaliate and condemn and shame and blame and get revenge, and when fear is so loud, it's all we can hear, and the depression is pulling, and anxiety is choking, and it feels like the it in our lives will consume our lives and we're powerless and helpless and going to be consumed by it all when it all comes falling down the Holy Spirit is in us with us empowering us so we can throw away fear hate worry stress anger and instead through the power of of the Spirit in us, produce something very, very, very different. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit is with us at all times, working through his power to produce love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness, and self-control. Why? Because when it hits the fan and everything in you wants to be consumed by fear, he's producing peace. When it hits the fan and everything in you wants to react with anger and hate and retaliate, he's producing gentleness and goodness. When it hits the fan and you wanna throw in the towel and give up and walk away and say, forget you, he's producing faithfulness and self-control so that you can stay the course one more day. The Holy Spirit is God in you, with you, encouraging you, reminding you, you, empowering you, working to produce this in you. Some of us have been following Jesus long enough that we can look back and we can say, I've seen that moment. I've seen that moment when peace that should not have been there was there. I've seen when my natural response was to attack it was replaced with gentleness. I've seen when my desire to be unfaithful was overwhelmingly replaced with the desire to be faithful. But some of us, some of us, if we're honest, we would say we've been doing this Jesus thing, this church thing, and we feel like we've asked him in our lives, but, but, but this list, this list wouldn't be the list of our lives. And when we look at this list, we start to wonder if we've been gypped, cheated, if God sold us short. God, uh, God has a really weird way of getting my attention and speaking to me. And, and about a year ago, I wanted to get another arrow tattoo on my forearm. I, I've got an arrow for each of my sons. And about three years ago, we welcomed a young lady into our home who's now like grafted in as like a daughter to us. And so we wanted her to know that she would be forever a part of our family. So I wanted to get an arrow for her. And so I reached out to my friend Kelly McMaster and Kelly's a part of our York campus and she's just an incredible tattoo artist. And so I was just like, Kelly, I, I, I wanna do this arrow thing. And and if you've been around for a while, you've heard Kelly and Derek's story. And they're just this incredible, incredible story of what a life changed by Christ can look like. So, so I reached out to Kelly to get help with the arrow. But one thing turned into another thing. And, and now I not only have the three, the three arrows, but I'm also hours into a, a half sleeve of my family story. And I've grown to simply love my chair time with Kelly. I love hearing her story and how God has so profoundly changed her. And hearing that... It's so inspiring to me. And, and so the other day, I'm, getting, I'm sitting in her chair and she's tattooing and she's talking and, and she just got really, really, really passionate. And she got on this rant and she just starts preaching to the preacher and she's like, Matt, which I really feared she was about to drop Matthew, but she kept it at Matt and she said, Matt, you know, a lot of people wanna be a life changed by Christ, but they're not. They say they want it, but they don't allow it. She said, Matt, I wanted my life to change. I needed my life to change. I had a lot of things in my life to be freed from. But Matt, your life doesn't change if you don't want it to change. And this is where the spirit slapped me upside the head through her words. She grabbed her notebook and she pointed to Ephesians 4 and she said, Ephesians wasn't joking. And she read me, since you, have been, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, let the Spirit, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And she said, Matt, there's a whole lot of us not Letting the Holy Spirit 
do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. We're not letting him convict. We're not letting him lead, letting him comfort, letting him heal, letting him empower, letting him have his way in our lives. And she was like, Matt, my life was all sort of messed up. But each day, I gotta choose to let the spirit have his way. So yeah, life will hit the fan. Things will get crazy. But I gotta ask, are you letting the spirit work in you? Am I letting the spirit work in me? Because don't we all want the power to respond differently when it hits the fan? So, are you letting the spirit do what the spirit needs to do? Are you listening for him, asking for him, looking for him? And then when he nudges, invites, guides, warns, are you following? I want you guys to hear the story of Latanya. She's a part of our Hanover campus and man, has it hit the fan for her. In fact, it, she's had a lot of it hit the fan in her lives. But, but I want you to listen. And I want you to listen to how she had these nudges, invites, questions, and listen to how she took baby steps. Baby steps to let the Holy Spirit lead. And then listen, listen for where it led her to. So I grew up in the suburbs of Baltimore. My childhood was very tumultuous. My mom battled an alcohol addiction. My dad was pretty depressed. And I experienced a lot of verbal, emotional, and even sometimes physical abuse. And not just in the home, but even from other family members outside of the home. I remember as a child just kind of thinking like, why are people acting this way? Or why are they treating me this way? it shifted my relationship with God. In my mind, he punishes bad people and he's, you know, nice to good people. I wanted God to love me, but I was coming into almost like a realization that maybe it just wasn't gonna happen. I'm a bad person and I don't deserve blessings. I deserve these horrible things. I was in two abusive relationships for five years each. I had no more fight because initially I'm thinking God abandoned me, I'll figure it out. I, I'm like, I can't, I can't figure it out. I can't do this anymore. And I walked away and I took a break. And during that time, I'd meet this guy. He's really loving, he's really compassionate, just overall great person. And I'm starting to feel like, man, this is what it feels like to be loved, this is great. Like you're pregnant, it's twins, we're nervous, we're excited. You know, we, we have our twins, two daughters, and two months later, I wake up in the middle of the night to check on a crying baby, and what I find is him lying face down at the bottom of the stairs. It's almost like, what do you want from me? Because at this point, I'm thinking, why can't I have a family? Like, why can't I have happiness? Why can't I have, my kids don't get a dad? Like, I don't, why can't I have anything? Like, I'm sorry. So I spent a year in grief counseling and it was really helpful. It was probably the first time I ever thought that healing was possible for me, that I was deserving of something different. If I'm, deserving of healing, and if I'm deserving of something better, maybe God doesn't hate me, but then how does he feel about me? So I came to Hanover, Pennsylvania, thinking new scenery, new life, kind of a new chance at something different. It was January 2020, and this kind of Conviction comes over me. That's the best way I can think to describe it. It was like a like an invitation, like obedience. So it's like, okay, is God asking me to be obedient? So I started kind of getting instructions. Like if I ask you to do something, will you do it? If I lead you somewhere, will you follow me? When I feel like the Holy Spirit 
asks me something or shows me something, I will give it a try. <laughs> there was never like this peace and this comfort, like, oh, the Lord told me to do these things and I'm going to do them. And it's just so much peace. It was like, Lord, this is crazy. Why are we doing this? But it wasn't until I took the step that I could see him working. I started going to LCBC and got connected and, and it really made me think about my story. When I typed it up in my laptop, I called it My Story, His Glory. <laughs> I have these absolutely amazing twins. I am a few months away from graduation. Like how far I had come. I feel like he was always pursuing me. There were always breadcrumbs. There was always something there to let me know that he was still there, which is why I couldn't look up and just say, he doesn't exist because I'm suffering. He was always there. I have a relationship. Like I have somebody I can go and talk to. Like I can say, Jesus, this is hard. I can say, Jesus, this is great. Just a relationship, like somebody that I can connect with. It's just like somebody I love and he loves me and it just feels good. My name is Latanya, and I am a life changed by Christ. Man, I love her story. Latanya, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being brave enough to invite us in. Guys, I, I love when she said there was always a breadcrumb to follow. Those breadcrumbs, that's the Holy Spirit. Guys, I want you to know, you're not powerless. For those of us who have trusted Jesus and invited him into our lives, the God of the universe has sent his spirit to dwell in you, to empower you to comfort you, to guide you, to help you. So will you let him? Will you let him? Today, I wanna to invite everyone to sit up and I want you to lean in. So go ahead, sit up, lean in, and I want you to put your hands out in front of you. And in your hands, I want you to picture your it. That thing in your life right now that you weren't ready for, you weren't prepared for, you didn't ask for, but you got it. I want you to picture it right there in your hands. And I wanna ask, will you let the Holy Spirit lead, comfort, guide, help you? In the middle of it? Are you brave enough to simply say, Holy Spirit, I need you. And I give this to you. Can you just give me a breadcrumb to follow? Guys, you're not powerless. The God of the universe is with you. But if you've not invited Jesus into your life, if you've not accepted what he's done on your behalf, man, I say this with all the love and grace and tenderness that I can, but I just gotta let you know, you are facing it alone, but you don't have to. Jesus made it possible, and all you gotta do is invite him in and ask him to walk with you through it. And in all of our rooms, there's folks right down on our left-hand side waiting to pray with you to help you accept what Jesus has done for you and to invite the Holy Spirit in. Why not do that today? And for those of you online, man, if you just text TRUST to 20022, there is a team waiting to get back to you. Guys, you are not powerless. The God of the universe lives in us through the Holy Spirit. 
And he gives us the power to respond differently when it hits the fan. Jesus, right now across all of our rooms and online, there's thousands of people holding their it up to you. And Jesus, I just pray that you will help each of us to extend our hands to you, to give it to you, and to know that through the Holy Spirit, you are reaching back to empower and guide and heal and direct and to comfort. So God, may we extend our hands and take hold of yours, knowing that we are not powerless, but you are with us, in us, comforting, enabling, empowering, guiding. So may we let you do what you need to do. Thank you that you are the God who comes close. We love you. We thank you. We trust you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.